Thank you for voting me. I'm really thrilled to be here. And not only that, but this is my first IGLTA. So thank you for, for all of the insights from all of the speakers and presenters that I've heard all week. It's been a really great experience for me to be a part of your community. Um, feels great. So thank you so much. So that's me way back when. Yes, it's been three years since marriage equality came to the US, every state. But it's been 13 years since marriage equality came to Canada. So I, we should certainly not forget about how Canadians were way ahead of us. Back then, that, was, that picture is 14 years old, when I was barely more than a baby dyke. <laughs> Standing on the state house steps in Massachusetts, when couples were fighting for their rights to get married. Couples who had been together for dozens of years in many cases. And I looked around and I saw this, these couples and I knew that someone was going to have to plan their weddings. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that they could feel safe in a very heteronormative industry. In an industry that was very traditional and assumed there was only one bride and that there was always a bride. So I started my wedding planning company, 14 Stories. So a lot has changed since then, but there are actually some fundamental things which haven't changed at all. So lesson number one from three years post-marriage equality in the US, we are on the move. Unsurprisingly, we know how much LGBT folks travel, but about a third of us are choosing to have destination weddings. About 63% of us are doing honeymoons, but only about 25% in the US. So we are traveling on honeymoons, we're going to exotic places. I can tell you anecdotally from many of my clients, former clients, I don't really plan many weddings anymore. They're going to places like India and a month in Australia and New Zealand. They're going really cool places on their honeymoons and for their destination weddings. I've heard lots of numbers all week about the number of countries with marriage equality. I think it's 26, but you can see the map here. Most of North America, much of Europe, much of South America, and then of course most recently Australia. It's been very exciting to me to see a couple of countries, namely Ireland and Australia, allow marriage equality because of a voter referendum. That is pretty powerful stuff to see voters actually choose marriage equality, and I think that sends a powerful statement of welcoming. So because I don't plan many weddings anymore, I have to find out and keep my pulse on what couples are really looking for. So I stalk them, message boards and chat rooms. These posts that I'm gonna share with you are from this year, from just a few months ago. This one couple is looking for an all-inclusive package in Costa Rica, Hawaii, or Tahiti. Uh, good luck with that, I think we all know, by the way. This other couple is looking in the Punta Cana. So they are taking destination weddings. They're specifically looking for gay-friendly destinations. They're choosing that, or they're looking for properties that are marketing themselves as LGBT-friendly. So couples are really very interested in making these choices. As we saw from the community marketing data, the top destinations chosen by LGBT couples for their weddings include Europe, followed by Mexico and the Caribbean, and then some US destinations. But I think there's a huge opportunity here for properties in Mexico and the Caribbean to do a better job. Many couples visit those websites, they visit the marketing, and they don't see themselves welcomed. And so there's a huge opportunity, particularly in places that have a strong wedding infrastructure, particularly for lesbian brides. Really consider the opportunities in Mexico and the Caribbean and, and the, the missing, uh, the potential that's not being fulfilled in those destinations. Lesson number two, we are very independent. We are much more likely to pay for our wedding ourselves than opposite sex couples. We are older when we're getting married. Our wedding party size, our wedding uh, guest count size is smaller than opposite sex couples. 
Many of these are for reasons like we're not always inviting our extended family or even necessarily our immediate family, but more our chosen family. We are spending an average of $25 more per guest. Not much, we are having fewer guests. Straight couples, by the way, are averaging around 140, 150 guests per wedding. Lesson number three, we are traditionally untraditional. My rule of thumb is that in general, lesbian brides are more bridal. They just are. Many of them were raised with that idea of the fairy tale. Many of them are much more willing to be traditional than gay men. It's very interesting when we look at the data of which wedding traditions are followed. Straight couples, even the ones that are having the most creative and non-traditional weddings, are still following so much of the gender-based wedding traditions. Lesbians are about half and half, and gay men are far less likely to do things like dance with their parents, even have a first dance, get dressed and ready separately. 20% of same-sex couples have no one standing up with them at all. We're much more likely than straight couples to have mixed gender wedding parties. And to avoid the question or the assumption of who's the bride in the relationship, many couples actually walk into the ceremony space holding hands together as a unified force, as opposed to one person being escorted and presented by the other, and then the guests thinking, oh, that one must be the bride, right? <laughs> Many same-sex couples, if they don't have, especially if they don't have gender roles in their relationship, are looking to avoid gender roles in their wedding. So when wedding businesses work from the perspective of gender, and they have all of these assumptions that go along with what a wedding looks like, they're missing the opportunity to truly allow same-sex couples to be creative and allow them to express themselves. But unfortunately, that's the norm, is that the wedding industry has not really opened up that opportunity. This couple posted, we are both wearing wedding dresses and we're getting ready together, no bridal party. So lots of couples are getting ready together, they're seeing each other before the ceremony, they're doing their photos before the ceremony. All of these things are very common. Lesson number four, we are oh so queer. Some of you have probably seen this stat, that 20% of those who are 18 to 34 are self-identifying as LGBTQ, right? And 12% as transgender. So even if you think that stat from the Accelerating Acceptance Survey is way high. The reality is that the future is fluid. Even if that stat is 5% or 10% too high, we all know more and more folks are identifying as non-binary. They're identifying as transgender. Ontario now is issuing a third gender on birth certificates. If your staff is not prepared to greet this guest without using sir or ma'am, you could be in trouble. More and more people are identifying as fluid. So how is your team prepared to serve the fluid guest? It's very, very important. This couple posted, I am non-binary and my partner is a cis woman. Does everyone know what a cis is? Some of you do? Should learn. <laughs> I'm terrified as being seen as either the other bride or being put into the groom category. We're mixing a lot of traditional gendered things, no dances with parents and we're walking down the aisle together and we're going to have mix and misses decorations everywhere. These are real couples expressing their fluidity expressing the openness of their, how they define marriage, their wedding. All right, lesson number five, trust is everything. And this is the main thing that has not changed in those 13 years since marriage equality came to Canada and the 14 years since marriage equality came to Massachusetts. Trust is everything. About a third of, a, a third of lesbians report being rejected by wedding vendors. About 10% of gay men report being rejected. But many more are afraid of being rejected. 
And about 90% of these couples want you to make it very clear without any doubt that you are welcoming to them. So whether you work for a travel bureau or whether you work for a hotel or resort, what are you doing to send a signal to couples, to lesbian couples in particular who are more likely to get married, what are you doing to send them a signal to eliminate any fear of rejection that they have? That is the, that is the big question. They want to know how safe they're going to be in your destination and at your property. It is a really, really big, important lesson. This couple posted, the wedding industry is yet to evolve on this, and it can be frustrating and alienating. They're feeling alienated because they don't see themselves represented. Right? So how are you going to allow them to see themselves represented? So at this point, I was going to show off some of my former clients, some of my former hotels and resorts that I've worked at. I've trained and consulted with them. And I was going to put up some amazing slides of all of the great work they've done. And as I was putting together this deck and looking through some of my clients over the past year, went through their wedding website, their, the wedding section on their website, I was hoping to take some great screenshots for you. They did not do a damn thing. So they got their staff trained, right? They talked the talk, but they didn't change any of their marketing, right? So my challenge for you is are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to update your marketing materials to be more inclusive? Are you willing to eliminate heteronormative language from everything you have that's wedding related? It doesn't have to piss off straight couples to welcome gay couples. It's actually very easy. Are you willing to do the work? It's one thing to be at a conference and we're all furiously taking notes and there's so much to learn and so many great connections to have. But we all know what happens when we get back to our desk. We get busy again. We get distracted. So my question is, are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to change, to make the steps that are necessary to improve the, lo the level of safety and security of the LGBTQ community beyond, weddings and beyond? Thank you. I have some time for questions. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to chat with you for eight or 10 minutes or so. Yes. Absolutely. You can just say, good morning. How are you? <laughs> it doesn't, right? You know, sometimes it's like, it's, uh, so the question was, how do you greet someone without saying sir or ma'am, right? So honestly, simpler is better. You can just say, good morning. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for visiting our property. The couple, the, the guest is not going to feel slighted if you don't use sir or ma'am. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, do you see that, do you see cruises, sorry. Do you see cruises being more popular for LGBTQ couples, uh, for weddings? According to the community marketing data, I think about six or 7% of us are taking cruises for our destination weddings. So that's a solid amount of couples, for sure. And I think it's just gonna keep growing. Absolutely, especially because I think there's one cruise line now that's uh, chartered in Malta, and Malta has marriage equality, and so that certainly opens up the possibility of legal marriages for couples. Many couples are not having legal marriages in their destinations. They're simply having symbolic marriages, but I think that the ability to have uh, a legal marriage, which could be recognized at home, is, is certainly compelling, and I think cruises are a great option. Yes?
I thought everybody could hear me, but thank you. <laughs> um, when there were only a handful of states where you were legally married, a um, state like New York saw a huge increase in both out-of-state couples coming to marry and international couples to marry. Um, we've seen a drop in the number of couples coming to marry and an increase in the number of couples coming to honeymoon. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any other indications of this sort of, we'll marry close to home, but now we'll feel freer to move around and find other places? So I think what we're seeing here is same-sex couples are following more traditional trends of opposite-sex couples, right? So now that they can get married in every US state, they're choosing often, you know, essentially 60, two, essentially two-thirds of the time, they're choosing to marry somewhere where they could have the most number of people, right? So I spent, when I was living in New York, my company planned many, many weddings with couples from like North Carolina and Atlanta and, and Texas who were traveling to marry with us in New York and sometimes having a little party at home. But yes, now those couples can stay home and the money that they're spending, that they were spending on their destination wedding and maybe the party, they're actually just spending on their honeymoon. So I think it's sort of going to mirror what opposite sex couples are doing with probably a higher percentage of destination weddings. Hi, how are you? Oop. I'm right here. All right, hi. Thank you for the great presentation. Thank you. Um, for me, like representing the Dominican Republic and working with the different hotels that are not uh, familiar with this market, and let's say I do my certification with you and I want to promote Dominican Republic. You go and you um, do the training for the sales team. Mm -hmm. What about the entire property, like the front office, mm -hmm. the housekeeping department, all of the different um, people that also have the connection with our, you know, our clients? Sure. How are we going to educate them and how I'm going to feel secure to bring my clients to those hotels if they are not fully prepared? Like, what is your recommendation? How can I approach them? to become certified and to also prepare sure. themselves for this type of client. Sure, um, so I have a, a new client in Cancun, in, in, River, in Riviera Cancun, and it's a brand new resort that's opening and I'm training the whole team. So the front, the front desk team, the spa team, all, and all frontline employees, whether they're in wedding or any element of the front line that's touching the guest experience. So we are gonna do a live training uh, pre-opening, but there's also e-learning available. My company has an e-learning. So that's an opportunity for folks who can't, can't get off the floor but still need to learn this type of content and make sure that those couples know that they can feel safe. So I think it's definitely important to train team members in a way that is non-judgmental and non-preachy, right? So I think that that is critically important with real life role plays and all of that stuff. Um, but, you know, beyond just doing the work to train the team, the marketing component has to send the message that these couples are welcome. So that is really, I mean, that's huge, right? The marketing has to show us in those destinations. And as we know that our community is so diverse, so it has to show different types of us in those destinations, depending on who the target market is, right? So. I mean, there's a lot of work that can be done, but I think the front, uh, on the front side, marketing, and then sort of on the back side, training, and that's sort of the, the one-two punch. Any um, other questions? Yes. I have a question. My name is Anthony McCrary. I'm with Caesars Entertainment Corporation. And so you, I just want to know if you can expand a little bit um, on the marketing initiatives that you think that should be included in some of our uh, e-tools or some of our marketing pieces. If you can expand about that, because you mentioned earlier, like, you know, you don't, um, the LGBTQ community doesn't feel, you know, included in those particular areas. And, mm -hmm. you know, could you give me some, some examples? I would love sure. to share these with our team so that sure. we can make sure that we're fully represented. So sure fully one represented. thing that's a, it, as a couple is looking through a venue, let's just say a venue's wedding packages, many times the packages say things like, it includes a bouquet for the bride and a boutonniere for the groom. It has a dressing room for the bridal party. It has a 
a honeymoon suite for the bride and groom on the wedding night. That type of marketing language immediately sends a message to same-sex couples that, mm, I don't know, it doesn't feel, doesn't feel quite right. I'm going to have to come out. How is it going to be if I come out? Mm, it could feel a little bit vulnerable. So it makes them feel more insecure, right? So certainly by changing that type of language is critically important, but also just using imagery to show us. Because when we are looking around at wedding images, when we're looking on Pinterest, the vast majority of what we see is opposite sex couples. And I get it. I totally get it. That's the way it's always been, right? But the more a property and a destination can do to show people like us, the more successful they're going to be. It's very, very simple. But a lot of destinations and a lot of properties are afraid because they fear losing business of opposite sex couples. And, and the reality is that there's a lot more to gain than there is to lose. Are, you, are we done? All right, thank you so much. <laughs>